Hi, I'm Andy Dolph, and I'm here again with Leela Sinha, the author of You're Not Too Much, the book about intensives and expansives, which is coming soon. And we're going to talk about a really kind of different angle in this video, which is to say the idea that it's not just people who are expansive or intensive, but also organizations. So, so why don't you talk about that character of an organization? Well, you know, I think it's important to think of this in terms of there are the members of the organization, there's the leader or the leadership of the organization, and then there's the organization itself. So in one of the other videos, we talked about, um, about families. And we talked about how, you know, if you imagine your like stereotypical New York Jewish family, that's kind of an intensive environment. Not kind of, it is an intensive environment. And if you think about like your classic British family, that's kind of an expansive environment, right? And you imagine the two of them trying to have Christmas dinner together or, and, and, or Thanksgiving dinner together is probably a better one. And, and like, how does that work? Like, how do they even communicate? Because when you have a cultural space where the appropriate way to show that you care is to get really loud and in someone's face, <laughs> and when you have a cultural space where the appropriate way to show that you care is to not be terribly offensive, right? How do those two people show each other that they care in a way that they both understand? Yeah. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's hard. It is hard, but it's also really, really important. And it's important in families, but at least in families, you have blood and love, hopefully, binding you together. In institutions and corporations and volunteer organizations, you don't have any of that. You just have a common cause or common values. And that's not as strong a bond. So it's really important to understand who you're dealing with and how you're interacting with them. So, for example, if you have an organization where the culture of the organization, the habit of the organization, is that everything's always on time and everybody goes home at five and nobody ever works late, nobody ever comes in early and, you know, exceptions to everything are the exception. They're, exceptions are not a thing that happens very often. That's an expansive institution and it kind of doesn't matter whether you have a lot of intensives working there or not. The institutional culture, the institutional rules, and the institutional structures will support that expansive behavior. And that can happen over years, over decades, over lifetimes, if you're the Catholic Church, over millennia, um, that you end up with a very structured, very regular kind of habit of being. Mm. And that's really, a habit of being is really a, a good way to describe what we're talking about when we talk about intensiveness or expansiveness. So an intensive institution, by contrast, people come in early, they leave late, they work through their lunch breaks, and then they take you know two extra days off, and nobody really takes notes on who's taking what days off, because they're pretty sure that everybody's working hard anyway. People grab food out of the snack machines. So for example, software development tends to be a very intensive environment. Uh, accounting tends to be a very expansive environment. And you can have departments within companies that have an expansive or an intensive character, or you can have entire companies. Mm -hmm. Well, and you can have entire companies that have ex intensive or expansive characters. And that affects how the institution runs. And then you have your leadership. So before we get to leadership, because right. I do want to talk about that, <laughs> but let's take maybe a few examples of some well-known companies and talk about how intensive or expansive they are. Sure. What do you think? Uh, I, well, the first one that comes to mind is Apple. What do you think Apple is? You're the Apple fan. <laughs> I, I would say Apple is pretty clearly intensive. It is, you know, that they're passionate. They talk about being passionate about creating things that people are going to love to use. And that that's really where their success mm -hmm. comes from, is that they have such a powerful vision. And so to me, that's a very intensive set of ideas. And I would wonder, at, at when I try to use it, now I'm not an mm. Apple person, when I try to use an Apple product, yep. I'm supposed to use it exactly this way. If I don't use it this way, then I can't use it. 
Now, is that an intensive, my way or the highway? Or is that an expansive, there's a nice, regular way to use this, and why would you do anything else? It's hard to tell. Um, I think given the background, given the industry that they're in, it probably is an institution that's, that's intensive. But it's a little tricky because, because as they've matured, so often young companies will be intensive, but as it's matured, it's matured into a much more expansive way of being. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so we talked about Apple, so I guess that means we contractually must now talk, talk about, about Microsoft. Microsoft. Um, and I would say Microsoft is almost certainly expensive. Yeah, I would agree. So why do you think Microsoft is expensive? Well, the first thing that came to mind is they're really skittish about pushing changes on people. That, you know, Windows, one of the problems of Windows is that it's tried to be compatible with everything for a long time, all the way back to DOS 5 right. would still run on, through, I think, XP. Now, your geek is showing. Right. You and I both have computer backgrounds, but not everybody watching this will. Suffice it to say that Microsoft has tried really hard to make it possible to hang on to their old stuff as long as possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, I mean, and they're keeping, they're consciously not breaking things that are, in some cases, 20, 25 years old or more, which is, in the computer world, ages, eons. And also, they have a tendency to take the existing thing and kludge it and kludge it and kludge it because that's the easiest way to make incremental change and not yeah. make it too disruptive. Yeah. Whereas Apple is all about disruptive change. Yeah. They're constantly coming out with new everything from operating systems to computer cables. Sure. And if you are happy about being part of an institution that allows you to be on the cutting edge of everything, you can feel the newness every time you plug in a computer cable that nobody else has. Mm -hmm. But if you're Microsoft, you're like, yeah, but everybody's already bought the micro USB cables. Let's yeah. stick with that. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So let's go to a completely different kind of organization. Okay. The Catholic Church. Oh, the Catholic Church. I could do a whole video on the Catholic Church. Um, I think the Catholic Church is expansive, but they have a bunch of intensives in them. And the Catholic Church is so big and so complicated that it's really, it's, it's one of the harder institutions to parse. But what really works in the culture of the Catholic Church, and you see it everywhere from their mass services all the way through, like, how do you become a priest? How do you become the Pope? Like, all of that stuff is this very slow, regular, incrementalness. And you look at, you know, the way that the, the vowed religious, the monks and nuns, a, a, approach their religious practice. And it's, you know, get up at oh, dark 30, do prayers, go to breakfast, do more prayers, do some chores, do more prayers. Like, this very, very regular beating time with your life itself, which is beautiful yeah. and makes me crazy after two days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how about your denomination, the Unitarian Universalists? As, as we are now, we really have our roots only going back to 1961. There's still a lot of people alive who were adults and involved in the formation of the church as we have it today. And so there are elements of Unitarian Universalism that are very intensive, that have, um, especially when we do our social justice work, we get out on the edge, we're hanging Black Lives Matter banners, like, we are out there. We have been doing ceremonies of union for same-sex couples since 1958. <laughs> we live on the cutting edge in some respects. But we use the democratic process as a way of making decisions, which means that we need to get a large portion of our population on board in order to make a decision. And that often means that we make things in very slow, regular, incremental kinds of changes because that's the only kind of change that's possible when you kind of have to get everyone's heart on board first. So right now, I think as an institution, we're really in tension. We're heavily influenced by our leader. Um, by the president of the institution, the moderator of the institution. Um, but even without the president and the moderator's influence, um, I think right now there's still a tug of war mm -hmm. between the impulse to really dive into that identity as, as a prophetic voice and a leader in the community and the impulse to really be that welcoming, nourishing, 
space where people who have struggled with religion can come, as well as the place where those of us who are raised Unitarian Universalists can come. And that may be some of the conflict. I could probably write, you know, another six blog posts on that. Or another book. <laughs> or another book. Um, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. So you mentioned leadership. Yes. talking about the, that tradition. So how does the expansive or intensiveness of the leader affect the organization? <laughs> um, it doesn't change the organization, but it's like a relationship. It's like any other relationship. So when you have an intensive leader and an intensive organization, they interact like two intensives, mostly. And an intensive and an expansive, or an expansive and an intensive, will have the kinds of struggles that you might expect. Expansive and expansive works, mostly. Now, that's not to say that the intensive-expansive pairings can't work. It's just a little bit more challenging. It's a little bit more conscious work. So, when you have an intensive leader and an intensive congregation, something I haven't really talked about yet is the population in general. Now, I haven't done any mm. research. I'm not a social scientist. I'm trying to invite social scientists in to do this research because I can't do it, and that's not my field. But my experience is that the world is probably about 70% expansive, at least the, the Western world. is about 70% expansive. And so that means that even in an institution whose essential nature is intensive, you're still going to see maybe at most, you know, 40% intensives, and that's high, which means that the majority, and especially in a democratic institution, that matters, the majority is still expansive. So how do you take an intensive idea and bring it to an expansive congregation? It's somewhat like an intensive spouse bringing an idea to an expansive spouse. So the intensive leader says, "Wahoo! I have this great idea. We're going to knock the top, knock the roof off the sanctuary, and build three stories of affordable housing on top." That's the kind of thing that, right? and and if the intensive leader goes to the congregation and says, "Let's do this," the congregation is going to freak out because they're sixty percent expensive or more, and they need some time to think it over. They need some context. They need some help getting there. They might eventually agree with the idea, but if you present it to them like that, they're just going to have a knee-jerk reaction and back off right away. So what we have in most institutions is a board, maybe an advisory or a steering committee, and this works in for-profit and non-profit non context both. So when the, when the leader needs to bring something to a large group of people, the leader goes to the steering committee or the advisory board and says, so I have this idea. And the advisory board goes, okay, because if you've done it right, the advisory board is heavily intensive, but not entirely intensive. So the advisory board is on board, but recognizes the need to moderate the idea. And then you take it down the next step, and you've got your board or um, your, your um, upper levels of leadership in a, in a corporation, your department managers, whatever level you're working at, and they should be you know, about half and half. The reason they should be half and half is so that they can be advisory to the advisory committee or the steering committee um, in terms of how to moderate the message even more. Now, let me be clear. I'm not saying moderate the vision. Intensive visions do not compromise well. First of all, intensives aren't particularly skilled at compromise. But secondly, our visions don't compromise well. So we can't stay... We can't, we can't make the vision work if it's half. I give the example of a church that I once worked for where one of the ministers a long time in the past had bought up all of the buildings on the block where the church was located and just held them, you know, continued to rent them out in the ways that they had been used, but just held on to that property. And it wasn't until almost 50 years later that the church decided that what they needed to do was take down some of the buildings that were older and less repairable and turn it into a big community resource in terms of a new building that had a lot of accessible space and classrooms and whatever. That minister's vision wouldn't have worked if he'd only bought half the buildings on the block, but he used endowment money to do it, which a minister in most of our churches, most democratically run churches today, would never be able to do. So you need to you need to have people that can preserve the whole vision, but present it in such a way 
that the even the heavily expansive population can get get behind it. Yeah. Yeah. And this is you've given a lot of examples based on churches because of course that's your field or one of your fields, but I think it's important to just sort of reiterate that all of this applies whether you're talking about a major corporation, a startup, a church, a uh, a service club, right, or any a school, any kind of organization. Yeah, any organization where you have leadership and you have people, you have these dynamics at play. And even in a place like the Quaker Church, I know I'm going back to church, but even in a, in a place like the the Society of Friends, which are the Quakers, um, and they're very very egalitarian in terms of their leadership structure. But even there, you'll see these dynamics pop up. Um, and when you see it in a corporation, it's a little bit different because there's a lot more power at the top. Sure. But you can't just exercise that power and not expect it to have consequences. So even though the CEO can say, we're just going to do this thing, the CEO will be a lot better off figuring out how to sell it to the people that, that they're leading. Yeah. And is that something that you can help people with? Yes, absolutely. Um, and it's not only helping with the sell, but helping with the understanding of the institution. Um, I can help the institution understand itself. I can come in and teach people this framework so that everybody can start thinking about it. One of the churches I work with has had me present at the steering committee and at the board already, and they're starting to talk about when they're selecting leaders, when they're making choices about who's going to do what, what volunteer tasks in the con congregation they're deciding to use this as a piece of their information structure. Yeah, yeah, and trying to fit an intensive person to an intensive role. Right, exactly, exactly. So if you have a job that's gonna take, like completely eat your life for five weeks, that's an intensives job. And in order to take care of that employee, what you need to do is make sure that there's a period of time after that five weeks where the, the employee needs to do very little or nothing. Ideally, you can send them home on comp time for two weeks because they need to rest. They need to recuperate. They're like a sea cu cucumber. They just puked out all their guts. They need to go sit under a rock. Whereas an expansive is good for the regular long haul, this and then this and then this and then this kind of job. And they won't get bored and they won't get burned out doing that. Yeah, so quickly, and then the, the minute or so we have left, I want to talk about ministers, because you're a minister, yes. and it's something I know you've thought about a lot. Mm -hmm. So when a church is looking for a minister, should they be looking for an intensive or an expansive? That really depends on who the church is and where the church is in its development. Um, there are times when a church needs the contrast, and there are times when a church needs a match. Um, two intensives can burn each other out, two expansives can bore each other to death. Um, so you really have to have to look at the character of the church, of the people, and of the leader, and then make a decision. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So if you're intrigued and you want more, Lila will come and can work with your organization in person. Or, of course, the book is coming or we'll put the links on the screen so that you can uh, see where to go on the web or Facebook or Twitter for more information and to get in touch. Thanks for watching. <laughs>